there is never a perfect recipe. There is never a perfect product. You're only really as good as your last result. And if your last result is imperfect, well, then there's always work to be done. So what are we trying to achieve with our croissants right now? We're still working on efficiency, uh, but we're working on getting the beautiful result we want at the end, the crumb. So we obsess as bakers over the honeycomb pattern when you cut open a croissant. And so lately we have been playing with different lamination patterns, different folding ratios that produce different amounts of layers in order to achieve more or less openness, more or less layers, and we're trying to find the optimal internal crumb. Because now that we can achieve that honeycomb just about every time, we're trying to make it exactly the pattern and exactly the right web form that we want. So here we have a book fold followed by trifolds, and here we have four trifolds. And what we're trying to do is just compare the quality of the internal crumb. I'm using a bread knife. Uh, I like these angled serrated knives for cutting uh, crusty bread and, and also really for cutting anything. Uh, so this is the, the honeycomb pattern that we're looking at. Uh, and I'm kind of looking at the size of all of these, uh, uh, these holes right now, kind of looking at it from a baker's perspective and saying, what is the type of experience that I want to be giving my customers? Uh, I want an airy experience as they're eating the croissant, but more layers means more texture. Uh, so we're trying to find the right balance. Um, so this is a slightly different folding technique and the crumbs should also appear a little differently. So the book fold, I should really rotate these. The book fold seems to separate the layers further from one another. If you can notice that the layers in this one are closer together uh, than the layers in this one, it's because there's actually more layers in this one, I believe. Uh, we did one less round of folding in this one. And so then my trade-off is the layers are not as separated in the book fold. You can see that, you can see more of the layers here. And so from a baking perspective, once again, I'm thinking of things of the less separation of the layers, the more moisture that's retained in those layers. If you have too much clumping of layers, then, then you have an underproofed, gooey, terrible result. But if you have just enough, then it retains that butter a little bit better. There's a trade-off here. I'm, I'm really getting into the weeds with the pastries when we start comparing the quality of a honeycomb. Uh, the, the cool thing, though, is that over time, you can get to these really technical questions um, and start. And I, I assume that to some out there, these are just beginning stages. Because baking really is this journey that you go on uh, and that you stay on. And it can you can take it down any rabbit hole you'd like. Um, the croissants for us have been this giant rabbit hole from the beginning. Uh, they've sort of captivated everybody, everybody here. So I cut open another couple. Uh, this one is the four times trifold. This one is the, the book fold instead of the trifold. And I have another similar result. So uh, in these pastries, again, there's more layers in this one that are a little denser. It, it's more uniform, and so in some ways it's more aesthetically pleasing. But this one has more layer separation, uh, more distance between the layers, but some of the layers are actually still kept together. I personally prefer this result. I think that the pastry will age a little bit nicer. It'll dry out less. Uh, and so it'll be a little bit nicer on day two, which I have to think about how do my customers eat the, the pastry. As we move forward with our pastry program, we're thinking about how do we get better and better results? How, how does our product age better? So right now going into summer, we're actually playing with an addition of butter into our butter croissants. We find that the extra butter helps with the fact that it's hotter out. These pastries are dealing with the heat 
of the Saturday um, out at market. And so we're hoping that the pastries are nicer on Sunday with the addition of butter. We did this last summer and it turned out really nicely. So we hope this summer yields something similar. So I've got some butter that's been pressed out. Uh, it's been pressed out using our roll divider, which has a pressing function. So uh, it's not really designed for that, but we discovered that we had this giant press in the bakery back when we used to literally take pounds of butter and pound it down into these sheets. We would then roll it out and we would do this by the dozen. Uh, so we would spend shifts just pounding butter. And then we got a roll divider on auction and it does a whole lot more butter pressing than it does roll dividing. So we don't really make that many rolls, but it presses butter really well. So we can get it to this level. And now we're gonna move to some really cherished, hard-won equipment here. This is a dough sheeter. I'm never going to stop being in love with this guy because leading up to this guy, I spent a year and a half of my life laminating sourdough croissants by hand in a 120 degree room, trying to achieve perfect honeycomb, not really knowing what I was doing. It was arduous, hard work. Uh, and we saved up for this dough sheeter, which still is hard work, but we actually have control over the thickness of the dough as it comes down. We have a lot more precise ability to handle it. And our croissants come out more consistently. It used to require the level of skill that took six or seven months of training just to be a laminate our particular style of croissant. And basically I was trapped at the croissant roll because I couldn't get anyone else to do it in a practical way. So um, I love making sourdough croissants. It's really one of my favorite things in the world. I'm super proud of the croissants we make, but I want to be growing trees as well for the future of the bakery. So we bought a sheeter and we invested in this. Our roll divider, it's pressing function, which is not what it's designed for. It doesn't really have very much height clearance. So when the butter isn't pressed, it barely fits in there. Uh, so we have to put it between two parchments because the sill pats are actually too thick for the press. So we do this one extra step that's how much we don't like pounding butter after years of pounding butter seemingly all day. No joke, we had shifts of just prepping butter. The butter block in between these two sil silicone uh, mats, uh, they're called sil pats. You can bake with these. Uh, they're, they're a completely non-stick surface, so uh, they work really, really well. Um, so this, uh, this machine is now set to its thickest setting. I'm gonna pull this through. And what I'm looking to do with this cold butter still, because this butter was actually, came out of the fridge, it was pressed, it warmed during that stage. Temperature really matters. So when you try this at home and get different results, the culprit is most likely temperature. This is for croissants in general, you have to, have your temperatures nailed the entire time. Uh, so now the butter is the, the width of this silicone mat, and now I need to take it the length. So I rotated it on the sheeter. Every pass, I'm bringing the wheel of the sheeter down, and so there's a narrower gap, uh, and that's causing more of this butter to spread. Again, this is not the actual design of this equipment. Uh, this, this equipment is for the next stage, but we don't have a butter press for this roll and we, we make a lot of these. So this saves us time by basically improvising with the equipment that we do have. You can see that, that the sheeter started to eat 
the, the silicone mat a little bit, crinkle it up. That's why you can't put parchment through a sheeter um, and you have to use the sill pat. Uh, it's a little stronger, well, substantially stronger. So I'm gonna grab this butter. <laughs> I'm actually kind of greasing the, the machine as I do this, uh, which is not bad for, for all those rollers anyway. So I'm gonna perfect this butter sheet now. I'm gonna cut out the sides that, that sort of left that border. I'm using the, the silicone mat itself as a guide to create these butter sheets. So right now I'm basically just stuffing butter into the corners. And I'm gonna use the bench knife, apply pressure now to bring the butter together as a whole. And so now I have a butter sheet. Consequently, this butter sheet also is the perfect temperature range for lamination right now. If you can find that rhythm, you will also save months of arduous labor trying to perfect the temperatures. Because if the butter gets too hot when you laminate, it melts. If the butter's too cold when you laminate, it breaks apart and shatters into a bazillion pieces, leaving you and your dough in a state of nightmarish hell where you're just depressed for a day because you did all this work, you did all this reading or training or tweaking your last recipe and you messed up at the first stage of lamination. The croissant will show the shattered dough all the way through to the final pastry. Your customer, again, might not notice, but you certainly will at all the stages. <laughs> the parchment paper came into life when we put the butter on it to press it. Uh, the butter was between the parchment for about five minutes before it left the parchment. So throwing away a piece of parchment at that level would be somehow sinful. So there we go. We're gonna create sheets of these. So throughout the week we build up uh, our butter blocks that we use. Moving on to another one. I'm gonna take that same sill pat that I just used. Take my next butters. So these are, this is uh, five pounds of butter that's just been pressed down. Uh, you can still see how all the pounds of butter were separated before they were in the press. So you can see the strips that correspond to what the butter used to be. Oops, a little heavy handed there. So we're going through creating that width. I'm happy. I'm gonna run the length now. Ooh, got a little ambitious there. You can tell by how difficult it went through the sheeter. So I'm not gonna modify the width on the next pass. I'm just gonna keep the, the height of the rollers consistent. One side of my butter has already achieved the length that I want, the other side has not. And so I'm rotating just to press the side that hasn't. That was kind of a giant mess, uh, but simple to address. So I took the butter off the machine and used the sill pat as a guide. What I'm really doing, all I'm doing is taking all of this butter that's the right, it's the right thickness already, and I'm laying it in the spots that make the puzzle. So if you will, this is the puzzle making portion of our work week when we do this. One of the best parts about working in the way that we do 
is just the sheer amount of different things that I get to do through my day. Um, it is a ton to manage, and all of these things bring stress. Uh, so, you know, just yesterday we had an oven serviceman here uh, repairing something that went wrong in the oven, and and in our lives, the amount of places that could have problems result in almost daily problems to manage. It becomes, you know, a job to manage all the problems. When we first started realizing that life was sort of headed in that direction, where all this equipment that we had started to invest in for our bakery, you, know, you sort of always think about it um, in originally in, in one way, and that's, well, this equipment's going to let me save time and, and it's gonna be more efficient and, and whatnot, but it has to be paid for and then it has to be kept up. The equipment can break really quickly and if you don't know how to fix it, then you've just lost a lot uh, trying to acquire it. And we have not, in this operation, we have not dealt with a season without equipment failure. So if you're wondering whether you should start baking professionally, uh, and if you should start your own bakery, you should ask yourself, are you ready and willing to deal with equipment failure all the time? All the time. Uh, when you're first starting, you won't be able to afford much but old used equipment. Um, and if you can afford more, ask yourself if you have the stomach for, for working on your feet 16, 20 hour days. Um, baking's not easy. Every person that we've ever hired in here, I try to like scare them away at first and I try to scare them away some more and scare them away some more and if they keep coming back then I know that maybe they'll, they'll make it here for a little while. Um, it's a, it's a hard, hard job for sure. Yesterday we uh, mixed English muff or sorry croissant dough. We mixed it yesterday, the croissant dough, and gave it a bulk ferment. So just like our sourdough is fermenting now in the bins, uh, the croissant dough fermented similar at the ambient, you know, 80 degree temperature. But we fermented a little bit differently uh, because the end result for us is a dough sheet. So we give it bulk fermentation in heat and then we drop the temperature and we stretch these out into dough sheets and we keep them cool till the next day. Uh, at that point, we can take the dough sheet remove the couche. I'm gonna take my first bit of butter I gotta be really careful now because the temperature in the bakery is now 70 degrees. All winter we were baking in a 60 degree environment and 60 degrees is pretty much perfect for uh, your butter that's going into lamination. If you could keep it at 60 degrees all day, you'd be really happy, it's pliable. Um, once it gets up to 70 though, it starts to melt in your dough. Uh, so when the ambient temperature in the space is uh, higher than the butter temperature you want, the butter will naturally heat. Um, so we can use the refrigerator to cool it if needed, but it's best if you can just work in the right tempo um, so that you don't have to uh, cool it and then re rethaw it. Also what I've noticed about butter over time is, is that it only has its pliability one time. So if you melt it, it's never going to come back to the same consistency that it started. Uh, so that might also save someone some time and experimentation. You cannot melt butter and then get it to be in these pliable sheets uh, once it's been melted. It, it's then more prone to melting. So it will just melt through your lamination process. So I'm gonna take the other half of my croissant block and now I'm going to flip this atop the butter. I need to finish my workstation here by adding a little flour up top. So this is just flour that I'm going to work with in the, in the dough sheeter. 
I don't need a lot. That will be enough flour for the day probably. All I'm really doing is preventing the surface from being sticky. I'm trying to get this sandwich of dough, butter, and dough through the sheeter smoothly. We're gonna go on to the thickest setting of the sheeter. Before it goes in, I'm going to look at the edges and just be happy with what's going in. The devil is sort of in the details because the devil is in the preparation of these sheets and the temperature that the dough is right now versus the, the butter is right now. If you get those two variables right, then croissant making is not as intimidating. So now I stretched it to basically the full width of my belt here and I rotated it so that I can now stretch it the other way lengthwise. And what's happening is actually the soft butter is spreading through this block of dough along with the dough. And so what I'm going to end up with is basically this spread out sandwich of dough and butter, which will be my first layer. As this goes through, I'm going to work it backwards and release some of the tension. I'm noticing that I am approaching the point that the dough is breaking, so I'm putting a lot of stress on this dough, and I gotta be careful so as to not ruin this. So from here, I'm gonna trim the side. Now I have a straight edge, so you can see the dough, the butter, and the dough. Now I'm gonna take this, and I'm going to fold it uh, in what we call a book fold. So meanwhile, I'm gonna take the rest of the butter through the, the rest of the dough through the sheeter. I really have to be careful here. I really kind of tore this dough apart. Um, so this is a little bit of a dicey result. So I'm gonna take this dough and also release all of this tension back. You can see that I just stretched it to kind of its nth degree, probably stretched it a little too aggressively through the sheeter. So on the next sheet of dough that I do, I'm going to adjust. And this is just, this sort of also is a demonstration of having done this before and knowing how to react in a moment. Uh, because this is not, if you will, the perfect moment of croissant lamination in this very moment in time. Maybe we'll have a better moment on the next block but I'm again just going through my daily experience as a baker, and I can see that my dough is, is really falling apart here, so I'm going to have to be careful to preserve its integrity. This is similar to the result that we had last week when we tried to put five butters into the dough block, and we were just having a conversation about whether this was possible before we did this. Five butters seems to create enough elasticity so as to really go at the dough and stretch it to its max. Getting a good result with five butters seems to be a point at which the dough wants to fall apart. And as a result, it might just be that we have to settle for four and a half butter blocks for the croissant dough recipe that we're doing. We'll see. I've got another five butter batch coming up. If I get this right, I'm gonna be back to, if you will, even. I'm gonna be back to a decent block that I can work with and pass through successfully. Because each layer is also building strength that I hope I still have in my dough. This is by no means my strongest laminated dough. In fact, you can see that because I pushed that so far and started to break at the dough itself, the, the integrity of the butter sheet below the dough started to be disturbed as well. So I have this first layer of dough amongst all of them where I do have a little bit of shattered butter. It's not through the whole sheet. Um, and so I can still 
bring myself out of this to a really like beautiful laminated dough with a little bit of a challenge. We're gonna go back to a thick setting. This is going to be a key second pass. Now, when laminating dough, you can sometimes, uh, this would be a time to put the dough in the fridge before you pass it through again. There's different techniques, but for me, it's really all about managing the dough and the butter. I've got some dough that I'm not really thrilled with right now. The key here is if you do shatter any butter, to pass it through again through your sheeter before chilling it. I do not want to take this butter that's been broken apart into a, a lot of pieces and then refrigerate it right now. Because in that way I would be solidifying all the different pieces of butter and they would never become fluid enough to become one ever again. So I'm really trying to pass it through this uh, dough sheeter and spread that one layer of shattered dough out. Uh, I'm going to actually do this one more time, and by that third fold, we're going to be in good shape with this uh, with this dough. So I'm going to flour the top of this now before the third pass. The fold itself, where I fold it over as I've created more and more layers in the lamination, is now going through the roller first, and this is so it doesn't pull on on the layers. Uh, it just seems to work better that way through the sheeter. So this is the last round of folding that I'm gonna do uh, for this particular batch of croissant dough before these get rolled out uh, to be formed as croissants. And on this round of stretching and folding through the sheeter, I am going to end up correcting that shattered butter that happened when I broke the dough on the book fold. And you can already see it happening if you take a closer look at this dough that is passing through right now. So now we've gotten to the, to the millimeters that I want. And take a look, it is smooth again. You're not seeing the separation of butter. In fact, so if I cut this end here, you can see all the layers in there. And you're not seeing inconsistency here. You're not seeing chunks of butter. If that butter hadn't been well incorporated, you'd start seeing just chunks of butter. Instead, you're seeing lots and lots of layers forming. Uh, and that is simply because I managed the temperature of the butter as I was spreading it out. I could have had a complete disaster with this particular batch. This could have been a block of croissant dough that caused us a day's worth of drama. So if we roll the history tapes back a couple years and you encounter a situation like that, I'm, Keep in mind that this block of dough is valuable. It's going to end up making 70 or so, 60 to 70 pastries. Uh, and a lot of butter, a lot of time, effort, and energy. We've already put a day into it. So to mess up this stage was detrimental. It's like one entire person's week of pay uh, if, if we get this wrong. And yet we had to pay for the flour. We had to pay for the labor that brought it to this stage. So every mistake just painful and stressful. Um, learning how to adapt in those moments is survival to, to a baker. Um, so now we have a fully laminated piece of dough. I'm marking it with three finger indentations. That, that gives me an internal indicator that I've folded it three times and it is ready to sheet out. I do want to get this one cooled off now. I'm going to set it down and I'm gonna put it back into a humid walk-in. If my walk-in wasn't humid, I would have to cover this dough. Otherwise, I would get a really ugly piece of dried out dough later on. So we're gonna grab the next block and repeat the cycle. So this time, I am going back to what we've always done, four and a half blocks of butter, and I'm doing that because I saw and confirmed with my own two eyes an experiment that we ran last week with the same result. We put five butters through a block of croissant dough and we watched as the croissant dough fell apart in the first pass through the sheeter. Uh, so now that it's happened to more than just one human, I'm starting to suspect the butter is the culprit uh, because what else could it be? Nothing else in our process has changed. 
we could look at the strength of the dough blocks themselves. Perhaps we're fermenting them a little bit too far, but I don't think so because the dough came together beautifully after that initial pass. So we also make whole grain sourdough croissants. The, the flour blend that we're using in these is, uh, an, is a blend of Arizona heritage grains, including white Sonora, uh, which has been grown here since uh, the Spanish introduced it to the natives uh, hundreds of years ago in this, uh, in this region. Uh, white Sonora in particular has a really deep root system and grows taller than other wheat. That's one of the reasons why it's grown out of favor in modern wheat production. Uh, farmers prefer shorter varietals of wheat uh, because they're less likely to blow over in the wind. They're less likely to get damaged. Um, and I, I think that you can even more densely pack them. Um, White Sonora being a heritage uh, blend, a grain of flour uh, of wheat. White Sonora being a heritage uh, grain of wheat, it is... Um, it has that deeper root structure, which actually makes it better for the earth. I think from the gardening, uh, you've seen sort of a theme from me and that's more roots means more nutrients in the soil. We sort of have to start to look past last century. Uh, it was a little over a hundred years ago where we were able to isolate ammonia in a, in a laboratory. And by isolating pneumonia, we were, ammonia, we were able to give chemical nitrates to plants with all the available nitrogen that's in our atmosphere that otherwise doesn't break down for for plants the thing is when we grow that way everything we do requires that chemical input and we're robbing the soil of the natural nutrition that's there in the first place and we're never doing anything to replenish it so over time our soil just gets worse and worse and worse and that's the that's the land that we are passing to future generations um, by using heritage grains, we're part of a solution where we're not robbing the earth of nutrients and the wheat that we're uh, putting in our bread. I don't know if it comes across in video. It should probably come across in, in just my overall expression. I'm not at all, at all uneasy about this dough. It came through in this beautiful uh, block. It didn't compressed in the middle and bow. Uh, it's not shattered at all. It's going to get to go through kind of our regular process. So I'm gonna cut the end here, which I'm going to reincorporate back. But what I like to do is cut it into strips so that I can evenly spread it across the surface of the dough. And that way, when I am introducing this new layer of dough, uh, I'm not uh, doing so completely unevenly. So now I'm gonna bring the rest of the dough through the machine and I'm gonna cut the other end in the same way. This is just to achieve the shape that I want in the block. I'm gonna put this extra dough back in as well. You can see here's where the, the middle portion of the last block of dough was just shattered. There was hundreds of pieces of dough and butter that, that sort of were visible. Here, I can barely see the separation of dough and butter. There are little dimples where the butter began to break a tiny bit, and that is nothing to worry about. We have a really smooth uh, block of dough that we're putting through right now. This side of the dough block is drier in general. It was probably the side that was exposed in the fridge. And what I'm doing by putting it on top here is now I'm gonna fold the book over it and that, that slightly drier side will also rehydrate and become smooth over time. I'm cutting the ends here so that I can get a perfect block. I'm folding these ends back into the dough as well. There's just no reason whatsoever to waste this dough at this stage. We have run tests, we have looked at the crumb structure, we've tried to see whether you gain anything from from cutting away those trimmings and being really anal about those trimmings and it's not worth the loss of, of yield at the end. You can't see a discernible difference. You can run that experiment yourself if you want or just take my word for it. I spent a couple months on it. Um, so 
Now I'm going to go through the second round of folding, and then this one we're going to take a break from and put it in the fridge since we can run ideal. Back to that thick setting, went through there. I'm watching it through the sheeter the whole time, and I'm also watching its width, so I'm not really looking so much at the wheel of the sheeter that tells me how the thickness in millimeters, but rather I'm looking at the dough and understanding the the width that I need to get the block to so that it takes up the whole belt. And this is just because I've run the dough through the sheeter enough times that uh, it's kind of like driving a car, really. Um, it's not something that I, um, that, that I have to do on a daily basis anymore because I've put in the time. Um, and so every time I come back to lamination, it's fun to keep learning, though, uh, every single time you learn something new. So I'm releasing tension as I go. This is a pretty important step that we found. If you release tension as you go through your lamination layers, this is also by hand. If I'm rolling dough out by hand, I'm creating tension, and I need to release that tension as I go. Otherwise, that tension will build up in the dough. And when you roll it out onto the table, uh, it will actually contract the dough. You'll end up getting smaller pastry and less uniform pastry. Uh, because of that. And that doesn't just apply to pastry. That's a general, general good thing to practice, releasing tension when appropriate. So I have two in, indents here. That means that I'm not quite done with lamination. It's so that if this dough sheet were to get lost in any way, we wouldn't lose track of where it is. Because again, we're dealing with a lot of dough production on a daily basis. So this is just one of many. So we're going to take this one and put it in the walk-in now. Uh, this is kind of the in-between cooling process. We're trying to give the, the butter a chance to cool back down. Now that we've stretched the butter out, uh, we have made it go warmer in temperature. And if you take it through another time, it's going to spread through the dough more. That was desirable in the last block because we had all that broken butter that we were trying to reincorporate back into the mass. We essentially had colder butter because it broke at an earlier stage that we needed to warm up to a point that it, that it spread through the dough. In this case, we had an ideal lamination from the first get-go, even spread through the dough layers. And so instead, what we need to do is give that butter a chance to cool down and solidify uh, a percentage of the way back to that semi-solid state so that we can spread it out one more time uh, successfully and it doesn't get incorporated into the dough. Chances are that first block has a little bit more butter inside the dough than in between the layers. Uh, there will be a side effect to my, to my uh, blunder with the five butters, but that side effect will be so insignificant that I don't think anyone on earth, including myself, would really notice. Um, unless we cut through every single pastry and started to judge the, the layers um, really closely. Now that there's been some time for that uh, croissant block to rest in the fridge, we're gonna pull it back out and give it its third uh, round, creating layers of dough, butter, dough, butter in croissant making. Uh, and that's what it literally is, we're creating even sheets of dough butter, dough butter. The challenge is temperature. Here's my dough block that has the two indentations. That's how I know that I'm working on the right one. The other one that I worked on today had three indentations already. It's ready to go. So I'm flipping this out. I'm gonna put a light dusting of flour on top. It's already, it doesn't feel very sticky, so you can probably skip that process. I still have that habit from the days of hand laminating where every single time was such a pressure from the pasta roller that I used that I had to put flour on every single pass, otherwise the dough just stuck. So the sheeter is definitely a luxury. So see yeah, how it's getting caught at the edge. I'm just gonna prevent it from doing that. We're almost at the right width. Here we are. I'm gonna rotate this block now. And now we're gonna stretch to length.
Here's my final thickness. I will release tension here. This is important. You can see how the dough came back on the belt. And by releasing tension there, when I roll the dough out again and put it on the table to shape pastry, I'm not gonna run into a problem where the dough starts to contract when I cut it. Because uh, I've taken all that tension and released it here. This is where this, this sheet becomes fully laminated. And so I want to take, take care to line these layers up well. So I'm going to trim this edge. And this will also be the edge that we take a glance at. I showed you the last one, and that was the one that was sort of damaged in the first round. You can just see how nice all those layers are in there. 81 layers of dough, butter, dough, butter. Uh, so giving the, giving the pastry dough a little more time to cool down in the fridge uh, in between lamination rounds allowed the butter to cool down enough to where it spread and, and left those kind of crisp, extremely thin layers. On that other block, the butter's there. It, it's definitely more uh, combined in the dough as kind of the consequence to me experimenting with five pounds of butter instead of four and a half. So that, that half pound of butter across 60 pastries spread out changes the characteristics of lamination fully. A lot of people think that bakers are worried about sharing their formulas and think that by sharing their formulas, bakers are giving all their secrets away. The secret is in the willingness to wake up every single morning at 4.30 and get this thing rolling. The secret is in the willingness every single night at 10 p.m. to feed Harriet, whether I like it or not, whether I'm tired or not. Uh, the secret is in every single day working on getting better. And that can't be replicated through knowing a recipe. Uh, so I'll gladly share a starting point for these. That's not a problem. But you're going to have to figure out how to tailor them to your environment with the equipment that you have on hand that you have the ability to use. Uh, my equipment was not always the way it is today. And my process was not exactly what it is today when I had different tools. Uh, so there's the laminated croissants from here. We're going to again put these in the cooler to cool down for a little while. And later on, we're going to get after forming some pastries, forming, forming a sourdough croissant with these. I'm going to gently lay this croissant dough back, back in the humid fridge. And that's a wrap on the croissants. Going back to that laminated croissant dough that has now been cooling in the fridge, we're going to roll it out thin, and then we're going to make a pastry with it. It's a baker's gathering on the table, which is really kind of how, how we work every day. We each do our independent sort of specialized things in the morning, and if the day goes accordingly, then we can all sort of converge on the table and knock out the scaling hour uh, efficiently since it requires a lot. So I'm taking this chilled dough. It's still got a nice smooth top. I'm actually going to take the top, the side of it that's drier and face it up. Uh, by doing so, this will actually end up being the innards of the pastry because I'm going to keep it in this, in this uh, orientation onto the table. So all we're trying to do right now is roll this out flat to the appropriate thickness so that we can create the pastry layer. So I'm going to start really thick, bring it through. You're going to notice that the top separates a little bit the dry parts. And that's OK, because again, this is going to go on the inside of the final pastry. So we're going close to full width again. I have to be pretty precise uh, at this stage. I'm now taking the final result of this and cutting out pastry. So if I'm not spot on, it will affect the shape of my final pastry. So I'm rotating there. Now we're going to stretch it lengthwise. And we're going all the way down to the thinnest we've gone so far. 
currently for Pan de Chocolat, we're at seven millimeters. I'm releasing a little tension as I go and grabbing this metal rolling pin. Now I'm going to roll the dough up on the rolling pin, bring it over to the table and unroll it. On the table, I'm going to make sure that there is no tension built up. Just assess the dough. I've got a nice smooth croissant block. Now this one was my less perfect one. And we're making pan au chocolat with one of these. We're making sourdough croissants with the other. They have a different final thickness. Now this dough, I can tell, has smoothed out as much as I can, I can expect. So between the third fold and, and then in the fridge, that butter hardened up enough to where when I spread it into this final block, I got a really nice result. I, I think it's gonna make some great pastry and we have really nothing to worry about. Despite the imperfect lamination, you can see that the one is bigger than the other. So we're gonna take our bigger of the two, or longer of the two blocks, and that's gonna be our sourdough croissant. The shorter of the two blocks is gonna be the pan au chocolat. Reason being is we end up rolling up more mass on the sourdough croissant, so rolling them thinner actually leads to a similar size. If we go any thicker than this, they will burst out of the height clearance in the oven for the pastries between the racks. They won't fit into the bags that we have for them. We're going to measure out for the plain croissants. Recently, we started using a much wider base on these. We're always playing with the parameters to try to get the exact result that we want. So I did a five inch base. Now I'm going back through and tracing in between the five inches because I'm creating triangles. So each two and a half inch width represents another start of a croissant. On this side, I'm gonna trim this end. I'm gonna try to leave enough to where we can actually use this dough in the production of rosemary braids. So I left enough for that. I'm trimming the other end And now we're gonna cut out the triangles of the, of the croissant. So I'm gonna take a straight edge and get the edge of one croissant down to the edge of the other croissant. There is actually a direction to do this so that the pastry dough doesn't fold back on you. And for a right-hander, it's left to right. So you're not seeing any full croissants yet. I'm gonna go down the row and get all of these cut. As I'm cutting, I can see whether the dough is contracting on itself. If the dough is too warm, it will contract on itself. If uh, the, the tension is not released in the dough as you laminate, it will contract on itself. Uh, if you see dough that's contracting on itself, you've got a little bit of a problem to deal with. So it will make your pastries inconsistent. So you'll still get nice pastry, but they'll all sort of end up taking on a different size and shape because of that tension that uh, that was built up in the dough and then the dough started to started to contract when cut. So we're almost ready prepping this uh, block of dough. I've got this end here which is going to go with my croissant tips. We're going to create these little ridges in the dough that let us fold the edge over as we're making the pastry. So I'm cutting just long strips of dough 
that's been laminated, trying to get a decent consistency in the width of the strips. We'll braid these and make a nice extra pastry. Not all of our rosemary braids are made from this, these trimmings, but that's how they were originally designed. And uh, then a lot of people started ordering rosemary braids and we had to make dedicated blocks of pastry dough for the rosemary braids. Uh, they are really good, so I don't blame people for liking them. I'm gonna steal a few of these for myself because I really like making plain croissants and I'm jealous of all the plain croissants you're making over there. You know what else we can do? Turn off one hum. Ha, huh. a little quieter in here. That was the phase converter that I turned off. That's what allows us to use three phase electricity in a residential garage. It's basically a motor that uh, creates that other electrical phase so that the commercial equipment can run because a lot of that equipment is designed for three phase, which I guess is a more efficient way of transmitting higher volumes of power. Just so happens that most houses are not naturally wired for three phases of, of electrical current, so we have to create that one with a separate device, and that device makes annoying noises. Each of these gets two batons. You can see that these batons were actually made for us. They, they have a shape that suits the width of the pastry just right. Um, we even had the mold made as a semicircular mold. The original iteration was square and it changed the shape of the pastry and made it less round. So we had the chocolate maker go back to the drawing board and remake it. These are awesome, these uh, chocolate bars. We are very lucky to have such high quality chocolate going into our pastry. And we did a taste test amongst chef types and everybody wanted the 70% more. So I decided to make a switch from 60 to 70%. The chocolate in these pastries is, has a fruity quality to it. It's not overly sweet, nor is the pastry itself. A lot of people dump just huge amounts of sugar into their croissant dough. And we don't really find it to be all that necessary. Our croissant dough uh, can easily go sweet or savory uh, with the plain croissants only having, I believe the equivalent of I think eight grams of sugar in the final pastry. These guys are really just in the middle of their uh, journey here. They're getting shaped right now and then they're gonna end up back in the fridge. We have to do this part efficiently. If this dough warms on the table, it will begin to proof. And uh, we really wanna try to save the proofing for uh, Friday um, as, as these pastries proof all day for Saturday delivery. There's a lot of different techniques on the table. You can see that the sourdough croissants have a slightly varied uh, shape and technique to the pan au chocolat. Uh, there's so many different variants on, on croissant dough. We're gonna be doing one this week with mulberries, uh, where we use those local mulberries that we got this week in a pastry. Uh, so we're excited about that. I'm pretty happy with this dough. It's definitely a uh, more of a summertime croissant dough where it can tell it's just getting a little warmer than it would if it was January. They're already very beautiful with all the layers. Uh, to be honest, I think this is my favorite part where you can just look at the side of one of these pastries and see all the beautiful layering that it has. Um, you know that it's just gonna open up really nicely if we can nail the proofing. So I'm gonna let Logan finish up those chocolates and we'll move on to these plain croissants. So for these, I'm going to uh, start this first roll and then switch hand positions and roll into that iconic croissant shape. These are just a lot of fun. All right, finishing up these chocolates. We have a lot more of these blocks of croissants to make today uh, for the weekend. So we're now training these up and putting them back in in the walk-in. There is a step, if you're running out of fridge space and you're trying to get into croissants, 
there's a little hack you can make uh, in your production that will help you get more croissants made. So we didn't always have a walk-in. We actually built our own walk-ins this past winter. Uh, and prior to that, what we did with our reach-ins, which we had about half the refrigeration space before, is we would uh, stack them really close together on the trays like so and fit a lot more on each tray. And then the day that we were proofing them, we'd take them out of the fridges and retray them like this into their baking configuration. It was a lot of extra work to retray uh, thousands of pastries and it took a lot of extra time, but that was all the refrigeration space that we had. So the only way to produce as many croissants was to do this. Um, that's one of the reasons why we got to a point that we built a walk-in. And so if you're wondering when is the right time to put the investment into your space of building a walk-in cooler, you, you, you've got to be doing something inefficient first in my mind uh, that you're paying for. In this case, it was retraying pastries. And I remember this is where Emerald started on Friday mornings. I like would spend six hours just, just retraying. Just taking pastries, pastries that were put together like this and spreading them out on on then, sheet trays. That's when we would also have to put them in the proofing chambers on yeah. the feed racks and set those up, set up the humidifier, set up the heaters, find somewhere in the garage to put it. <laughs> Part of the job all day is just checking on things. So this room has now climbed up to 78 degrees. It is a walk-in, uh, so this AC unit can, can be turned on to cool and drop the temperature in here actually to refrigeration temperatures in no time. We do this with a thing called a cool bot. Uh, it's a really cool application where basically this device tricks the window AC unit into thinking that it's actually warmer than it really is. And so the window AC unit keeps pumping cold air from the outside. This is a heavily insulated room. So uh, we used to use reach-in fridges before the reach-in fridges, we were subject to the 110 degree temperature in the summer here. So as we baked sourdough croissants in the summer, we had no control of the process whatsoever. So literally the sourdough starter ruled our lives during those days. And that's why we were actually working 20 hour days in July, even though our business was at in the pits during the summertime with no one coming out to farmer's markets when it's 120 degrees out. So getting a space like this that we built over time is it's luxurious but it was a, a lot of a lot of time effort and energy a lot of blood sweat and tears to get this room into existence even the building of it when we had to displace space valuable space in the bakery uh, was really rough so um, these croissants uh, they started proofing this morning we're going to be baking them uh, later on. Uh, the key here is to see the expansion of them uh, in this room. So it's warm, it's humid. Uh, these devices around are keeping it warm and humid. Uh, but what I'm looking for in this pastry is growth. I'm looking for layer separation. So there's 81 layers of dough, butter, dough, butter, dough, butter that I'm actually making the next batch of today. Uh, but for this one, I'm just looking to see that, that layers, the layers will start to expand. And as you touch the pastry, it'll actually bounce back at you as though it has trapped gas that's still waiting to explode out in the oven. If I touch this pastry, there's very little bounce back and instead my fingers are kind of sticking to the top. That's how I know that we're hours away. Uh, but these pastries have to be in this perfect environment and this is the most important component of a sourdough croissant. You can nail your lamination, you can do everything else right, and you will not achieve a good result at all. Uh, and trust me, I spent a year of my life laminating over 40 hours a week, perfecting lamination, thinking that that was the answer to the sourdough croissant. It's proofing, so I just saved you a year. So we have fully proofed croissants now. We've judged these. I'm looking at them and there's nice layer separation. If I touch the top of the pastry, it's bouncing back at me, which means it's still got some life. These have already been egg washed, uh, so I know that they're going to leave nice, shiny, smooth tops. 
Uh, we just uh, dressed the rosemary uh, braid, so we put fresh rosemary and sea salt on top, and we're now gonna wheel these to the pastry oven. This is a small batch today. Uh, later in the week, we're going to be baking rounds and rounds and rounds of croissants, but this is just a, a batch uh, for, a, for a midday, midweek day. So we're gonna throw some steam on this one. Close the vent, set the timer. Uh, not everybody bakes croissants with steam. We find that it adds a really nice color effect to the final pastry and doesn't take away from the pastry's ability to rise in the oven. You gotta play with your current set of circumstances. Uh, like I said, a lot of people don't bake croissants with steam because there's plenty of moisture already built up in the pastry itself to release into the oven chamber. We elect to use steam though. We're gonna take a look at the inside of one of our fully baked pan au chocolat. Uh, this is probably the product that we have a lot of, probably almost the most pride in. Uh, locally sourced chocolate, it's a bean to bar chocolate, uh, DNA chocolate. Uh, it's a local operation here in Arizona uh, where uh, Danae, the owner, she grabs cocoa beans and brings them in single origin from a farm in Belize. Uh, she pays beyond fair trade costs for them so that the farmers growing the cocoa beans actually could do things like afford to eat chocolate. Uh, apparently most of the chocolate supply in the world is farmed in West Africa, often by children who can't afford to consume chocolate. There's a really cool documentary on Netflix uh, under the Rotten series on this topic. But we're trying to use chocolate that doesn't meet that criteria, is not commoditized in that way. And so Danae makes these custom bars that fit our pastries really well. This is a sourdough croissant, so it doesn't have any yeast at all. I'm gonna cut through it really gently so you can see the, the structure of the pastry. And so here is the, the crumb structure of the pastry. You can see the chocolate. Uh, you can see the honeycomb separation of all the layers. Uh, so all that this, uh, this pastry has is flour, water, sourdough starter, butter, uh, some sugar, uh, and salt. Uh, I don't believe that I missed anything. We have whole grain flour in a, in a portion of the, the recipe, uh, which brings more of a nuanced flavor to the, to the final product. Uh, you can see all the layer separation. This just means that we proofed it long enough and far enough and just right, so it's still got spring at the end, but all these layers beautifully separated. So uh, I'm really happy with this one. I think it's going to be really nice. The chocolate itself is a 70% dark chocolate, and this will be the first bite of food that I have all day. Uh, I practice intermittent fasting, and it's right at the opening window. I kind of view it as like a starting gate of a, of a race. Now I can eat for the next eight hours, so let's go for a bite. I like it just as much as I did when I was just a customer of Proofs going to the market every week. Turned out really nice. <laughs> Here, want a pastry? Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. 